Well, good morning. I want to wish you a happy Easter morn. We are here because Jesus Christ is raised from the dead. Let me call us to worship this morning with the reading of God's word from the Gospel of John in chapter 20. The disciples went back to their homes, but Mary stood outside the tomb crying. It was an empty tomb she had found, and they had found. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb and saw two angels in white seated where Jesus' body had been, one at the head and the other at the foot. They asked her, Woman, why are you crying? They have taken away my Lord, she said, and I don't know where they have put him. At this she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not realize that it was Jesus. Woman, he said, why are you crying? Who is it you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, she said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him and I will get him. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned toward him and cried out in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. She, Jesus said, Do not hold on to me, for I have not yet returned to the Father. Go instead to my brothers and tell them, I am returning to my Father and your Father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went to the disciples with the news, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. What a marvelous thing even after all this time. Let us join together with our uh, praise music uh, group and sing the praises of our resurrected Lord.
on this great Easter Sunday, let us come before the Lord in prayer. Oh, Lord Jesus, even as those who saw you that first Easter Sunday, so too we come before you this day with hearts full of joy and amazement and excitement and of hope. We thank you and praise you, O oh God, for all that you have done for us through our crucified and risen Lord. When we think about all that you went through just to bring us back to yourself, we are overwhelmed. When we think about how we all like sheep have gone astray, each of us having turned to our own way, and that all our sin was laid upon you, and that through your sacrifice, Lord Jesus, we were cleansed and washed clean. We are overwhelmed. When we think about your death and resurrection, we recognize that the world has never seen such a display of love before or since. And that despite our own sinfulness, you never stopped loving us. And we are overwhelmed. We thank you for the victory that we have over the penalty of sin. We thank you for the victory that we have over sin in our daily life. And that same power that raised you, Lord Jesus, from the dead lives within us. And so we come before you asking for your continual help in our daily battle with sin and our other struggles in this life. We recognize on this Easter Sunday that you are all powerful, God. And that you're more powerful than any situation or struggle that we find ourselves in. And so we pray for those who are struggling this day, whether it's physically or emotionally or spiritually. We ask that you would help them to be able to sense your presence in a mighty and powerful way. Oh God, we thank you that you will never leave us or forsake us and that you're an ever-present help. And God, we need your help. Our nation, our, our world, your world has been turned upside down by this virus and we need your help. God, we ask that you would help the doctors and nurses and those volunteers right on the front line battling this virus, trying to help those who have been impacted by this virus. Father, we pray for healing to those who have become sick from this virus. We pray for comfort to those who have lost loved ones because of this virus. We pray for your peace to those who are just filled with fear and anxiety because of this virus. Oh God, we need your help. And we know that you are more powerful than this virus. And we pray for your mercy. And we ask that you would bring this virus to an end. God, we are people of hope because our hope is in you. And again, we thank you and praise you for all that you have done for us and continue to do for us through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And we come before you praising you and thank you and asking all these things in the risen Lord Jesus Christ's name. Amen. It was the late 1950s and early 1960s and America was uh, beginning to want to explore outer space. And so we had to decide who would represent America in space. And the first person to go up in a suborbital uh, ride was a chimpanzee. And chimpanzees are very easy and they're fairly cooperative. And so they have some things to be said about them. So uh, some were arguing that we needed a chimpanzee in space. Some were arguing that we needed a scientist or engineer. Some said we needed a great athlete to uh, endure the rigors of space. And so uh, they found uh, a critter, if you will, that represented all three of these things, a chimpanzee, an athlete, and an engineer. And it's not a bad joke. Uh, what they found were U.S. military test pilots. Now, I say that because I spent some time in my uh, Air Force years uh, flying with a test group uh, that had uh, test pilots, and I've flown with them as a navigator uh, a good deal. And I know them well enough to, to suspect that if they disagreed with that analysis at all, uh, they would probably say uh, that saying that, that a test pilot was a combination chimpanzee, athlete, and scientist, they would say that might be a little insulting to the chimpanzee because they're a lot more cooperative than any of the other uh, groups. Now, all of this was brought to the uh, attention of American popular culture uh, back in the 1980s 
And actually, this movie uh, called The Right Stuff just came out uh, just uh, came out just before I began uh, working with this particular uh, flying unit, and it made uh, Chuck Yeager a kind of a common household name in the United States, where he had been really only known in flying circles and in the Air Force. Uh, so the irony, uh, two ironies in this movie, very interesting. Uh, one is that the actor playing Chuck Yeager, the guy who first broke the sound barrier, the guy playing him, the actor playing him, was deathly afraid of flying. The second irony was that Chuck Yeager himself uh, played a part in the movie, and the part he played was the guy sweeping the floor in the bar room where all the test pilots met after work every day. And the point is that what you look like doesn't ne necessarily mean much. Uh, the question that the movie and the book bring out is, do you have the right stuff? Well, we live in a life full of competition, and when we pick somebody that we say has the right stuff, then all of a sudden the rest of us feel like, oh, I don't have the right stuff. And God's message in his word, the Bible, is that in Christ, in the Lord Jesus, we come to have the right stuff. And that's amazing news. Now, God, throughout his word and his dealing with us, is always trying to get us to see the real values in life. He's trying to get us to see to see what life really is. And so he leads by example, as always, and he always breaks our expectation of who the person with the right stuff is. So if you're the greatest at anything, you may have a harder time understanding this principle because you think you're the person with the right stuff, and you have to get over that at some point, and, and that is part of God's message as well. So if you look at military power, you know, force, um, that's always a powerful thing. And the problem with that is, is that equipment that you use and technology that you use eventually rusts. It becomes obsolete and outdated. Somebody else always comes along with something better. If you're into financial power, uh, you'll find very quickly that money doesn't buy you the most valuable things in life. It doesn't buy you good family relationships. It doesn't buy you trust. It doesn't buy you real and genuine love. Uh, and so you'll be searching for that even if you make a big pile of money and even if you say to yourself, well, if I get enough money, I won't need any of those things. You'll need somebody to trust along the way. And if you're a sports person, if you're a great athlete, you have youth, you have speed, you have cleverness on the field, you have strength. All those things fade with time. That's the problem with having that right kind of stuff. And so our image, how we are seen by the, those around us, the world around us, is very important to us. And our image is a very important principle and topic in the Bible as well. God consistently shows himself uh, powerful through very normal, regular kinds of people. And he redefines for us what is the right stuff. And he started a long time ago in his story. If you go back in the book of Genesis, you'll see that Abraham had a firstborn son named Ishmael, who was a great archer. He was a great athletic man, I assume, from that, and probably a great hunter as well. And he had a younger brother, Isaac, who was not nearly as strong and who was a shepherd. Uh, but Isaac was the one who was chosen. Isaac had a firstborn son named Esau, whom he was very taken with, just like his uncle Ishmael, or excuse me, his brother Ishmael. He loved his son Esau, and he wanted to pass the blessing along to him. But the blessing went to the younger brother, Jacob, who again was just a shepherd. The baby Moses uh, picked up out of the Nile in a basket, to save his life, spent 40 years in Pharaoh's court. 
And then he spent another 40 years in the desert before God ever spoke a word to him. 80 years he waited. And then God called him. And then the next 40 years, he, he led Israel out of bondage, out of slavery from Egypt. And he took them to Mount Sinai and gave them the law. And he was the greatest prophet uh, that the nation of Israel ever saw until the coming of this Jesus the Messiah, this resurrected Lord. And then came David, the youngest of eight boys. He knew what it meant to be last in line, but he was the one that God chose and anointed. The king and the shepherd, you see, he was the shepherd. He was the youngest and stuck out with the sheep. He became the shepherd of all Israel. And from him came the Messiah from his body and his line. And so Jesus comes along finally. He is born poor. He is born in a place where the animals are kept, a stable. He lived his life as a construction worker. And it turns out all along that he was, in fact, the king of kings. God didn't have to put on a show for anybody. He just is who he is. And finally, the resurrected Lord of the universe appeared as in our, in our passage I read earlier. Uh, he appears as a gardener to Mary. Uh, and he doesn't mind being thought of as a gardener. He picks 12 disciples who are fishermen. They are political rebels One's even a tax collector, the most hated people of all. And then Paul came along. He was a tent maker, just a regular guy. So what kind of image is required to bear the resurrection power and life? What's the right stuff? It's whatever God chooses and whoever God chooses. It's the person who will allow God to be the right stuff through him or her. Now Paul is writing to uh, the church at Corinth in our passage today. You might want to turn there. We started last week at Palm Sunday in the second chapter of 2 Corinthians. We're going to still stay in 2 Corinthians and go to the fourth chapter starting at verse 7. And these Corinthian believers were set upon by people who were saying that the apostles, and especially Paul, didn't have the right stuff. They were not worthy of religious inspiration, if you will, or philosophical inspiration. They hadn't been trained in rhetoric and logic. And here's God's great irony that he brings over and over again, is that his strength is displayed in our weakness. And so God puts us on a balance beam, as it were. We live our life uh, on this balance beam. Two balancing acts that he asks of us. The first one is this, is that we balance our dying bodies with the living eternal power of God. And that's exactly what Paul expresses here in this passage. So let's read together 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and let's just read verse 7 here. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power from God is from God and not from us. There's a reason God does this to show that it's really him doing this and not us. This has been recognized long ago in the Old Testament, if you will. Uh, the rabbis in their uh, writings say that this about the word of God, that wine, wine cannot be kept in gold or silver vessels, but only in an earthenware vessel. And we know that in modern times as well. We've learned that you can't keep wine in a crystal container because the lead leaches out of the crystal into the wine and poisons it. But you rather have to keep it in a common glass container. So wine cannot be kept in gold or silver or crystal vessels, uh, but only in common ones, earthenware or glass. 
And so it is also that the words of Scripture can only be kept with a person who humbles themselves. That's how it works. Murray Harris, who writes about 2 Corinthians, says that God is not disparaging uh, our bodies. Paul, when he writes here, is not saying bad things about the human body. It's We're not just a receptacle for the soul. Uh, it's Our bodies are completely necessary in order to make the contrast of the inestimable, inestimable beauty and worth of the contents that he is placing in our relatively insignificant vessels. It's not what was called dualism in ancient philosophy that said it doesn't matter what you do with your body because only the spirit is important. Not at all. We're saying quite the opposite. It's very important that what you do with your body because it contains the po power and strength of God himself. And so this treasure that is in us, this gospel, we talked last week about not watering down uh, this gospel. What is the nature of this treasure? How valuable is it? Well, we talked about the fact that if you subtract anything from the gospel, it's no longer the gospel. You can't take away the fact that we need forgiveness. We are sinners and we need the Lord. You can't take away the fact that we are saved by grace alone. It's a gift from God. It's something God reached out to us and we could not do for ourselves. You can't take away the resurrection power and still have the gospel. You can't subtract anything from the gospel or it becomes not the gospel. Also, uh, the resurrection is, is sort of what binds all these things together. It's the proof that this really is God and he really means it. He took the very power that he created all the universe with and raised up the Lord Jesus so that we would be raised as well. And you cannot subtract any of that from the gospel. Likewise, you cannot add anything to the gospel because when you add something to the gospel, make it gospel plus, you are diluting the real value. You're devaluing the gospel. If you say it's the gospel plus my tradition, if you say it's the gospel plus my political power, if you say it's the gospel plus my special experience I have with God, you are saying, I need more from God than what he has given already. And we, we are to be unashamed of just being a follower of Jesus. There's nothing better than that. We don't need any... You can go into marketplaces all over the world, uh, especially in the Western world, and you realize that, that, that Christianity is a multi-billion dollar business, sadly enough. And you can find all kinds of things that make promises to you about your special health programs, the John the Baptist diet, uh, the Elijah diet, uh, the Elijah running program. He ran a long way, very fast. Uh, how about the Samson lifting program? Don't need any of that. Special experience? You cannot add to the power of the resurrection in your life. That is the most powerful thing that you're ever going to encounter forever and ever. You cannot add to the value of the treasure because when you try to do that, it actually cheapens it. It's sort of like saying, well, I'll let the barnacles grow on the hull of my boat because it adds to the gross tonnage and now I have a bigger boat. But that's the wrong answer. When you let barnacles grow on the hull of your boat, you are slowing it down and you are corrupting it. You are making it less than it really was. And so God's treasure in this earthen vessel that we are is enough. That's what he's saying. We treasure having the power of God, the power of God Almighty, in these important but temporary and common vessels that are us. And so we balance our dying bodies with the power of God himself. The second thing, and very much related to it, alongside this, is that we balance our dying situations 
with our eternal resurrection life in Jesus. Um, let's read on with Paul, still in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, now in verse 8, and I'm going to read for uh, down through 15. We are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We are persecuted, but not abandoned. We are struck down, but not destroyed. We always carry around in our body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our bodies. For we who are alive are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that his life may be revealed in our mortal bodies. So then death is at work in us, but life is at work in you, says Paul to his, uh, his people that he led to the Lord. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. With that same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you in his presence. Amazing. All this is for your benefit so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Now these things that Paul talks about, being crushed and perplexed, uh, persecuted, those are particular things in his experience in bringing the death and life of Jesus to the world. And our culture pulls us away from that. We pay money in the church, and we have for a long time. We idolize people who seem to have, in the world's eyes, the right stuff. We pay money to hear movie stars tell about Jesus. We pay money to hear athletes give their testimony about and watch their perfect performances on the athletic fields. Yes, we should give the best we have. Yes, we should do the best we can, and we should use what we have. But sometimes we commit idol worship in the middle of our Christian ministries. And it's not good for the people we are idolizing, and it's not good for us either. God's success is of a different kind. And so Paul was getting a lot of grief from some Corinthians that just said, you don't meet muster. You, you wouldn't cut it down at the Philosophical Society. He said he wasn't good looking enough. They said he wasn't eloquent enough. That was just a sign of how oriented toward the world they were. Now, for certain, we stand on the shoulders of giants who can say to us like Paul, follow me as I follow Christ. We respect the gifts that are displayed in God's servants down through the centuries, but we need to have a care about understanding what the right stuff really is. It's a call to do everything that we are called to do, and some of us are called to different places than others. Some of us are not called to stand in the great stadiums of humankind. Some of us are called, as the scripture says in the New Testament, to live quiet lives with a good reputation. God needs people in every neighborhood. Not everyone is on the road with Paul, and yet we are all uh, reborn by the same resurrection power. And so that is a marvelous thing. And so what do we do? We practice our personal spiritual disciplines. We learn the Word of God from our teachers and from being together and studying the Bible. We pray together and alone. We fellowship. We make sure that we see one another. We make sure that uh, our statement saying, I love God, actually has meaning by the fact that we love one another. It's only proven uh, in that pudding, if you will, uh, of loving one another that our statement means something that says, I love God. We also practice beyond 
personal spiritual disciplines. We bring those together and practice community spiritual disciplines. We worship. We bring our worship lifestyles into a common space. Uh, Right now we're doing an online common space uh, and hope to be gathered physically together soon. Uh, and worship together. We bring all that worship lifestyle together to encourage one another. I hope you are encouraged today by hearing God's word sung and read and taught. That's why we're here. So we worship. We connect with one another. Uh, That is part of our life together. We hold one another up. And finally, we worship, we connect, and we serve We serve one another and we serve the world around us. We are in these clay pots, these earthen vessels, and these things get out of repair. They get cracked and broken and we need to help one another. We need to help one another with physical needs, uh, whether healing, uh, whether uh, lack of food, whether lack of uh, warmth, whatever it is, we're responsible for one another. And so we serve, we worship we connect, we serve. The scripture tells us to be prepared with an answer um, for whoever uh, asked us why our life is different. And Paul was prepared with an answer and he uh, he started, he, he stirred up the question by going into public places. Not all of us are called to do that. But in our just regular life, people are going to see that we're different if we are practicing those spiritual disciplines. People will notice. How do you do that? Why do you do that? Be prepared with an answer. This call is coming right up out of the power of the resurrection of Jesus. It's because he was resurrected that we do all this stuff, that we answer God's call. And sometimes our call seems entirely beyond us, How am I going to do that? Impossible. Uh, The last passage we studied last week asked the question, who is adequate for this? Who's adequate? Who has the right stuff? Who has Jesus in their heart and in their life and is empowered by the Holy Spirit and taught by his word has the right stuff and is adequate for what we're called to. And so the resurrection did not happen so that uh, our situation would be easy or that our lives would be comfortable, but rather to empower us to love the world around us, the world that does not love us in, in many and most cases. We are, particip- or we are partakers in something that we did not generate of ourselves, but we are uh, receivers of a great gift We're not just hanging out until we get to heaven. Heaven isn't God's retirement program. It's when we're really ready to finally start doing something. We're not just hanging on. We are prepared to answer for why our life is different. And this is bringing, this all of us doing this together, all over the world, his followers, is bringing real life back into the creation even if it only starts in your neighborhood, in my neighborhood, with my life. It's happening in neighborhoods all over the world. And so that's what God is doing. So this, do not be discouraged, but rather walk with Christ. The pathway before you has been cleared. Many have suffered for the sake of this name, the name of Jesus, and we might suffer as well. In fact, Paul teaches in the book to the Philippians that when you suffer, if you are living your life for the Lord, then your suffering is suffering for the Lord. And that's an important principle. So live for him. And everything that seems like nothing to you will have value and meaning in the kingdom of heaven. But if we do it, it will be for the sake of others all around us so that they will have courage as well. Whatever we do. God uses regular folks like us, clay pots, even cracked clay pots, in which he keeps his treasure, in which he displays his awesome resurrection power. May the God of this great power and resurrection dwell in you 
this week uh, as you uh, are in the glow of this great week we have shared together in Christ. Let's pray together. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you were willing to go to the cross for us. Thank you that you trusted your heavenly Father to raise you from the dead, to break through that unbreakable wall. Be in us. Lord Jesus, if there is one who has not asked you into their life today, who doesn't know what we're talking about, may they take this moment right now and say, Lord Jesus, I need you. I need your forgiveness. I need your life. I need your resurrection power in my life. I need your Holy Spirit empowering my life. I need your word. And I want to follow you all the rest of the days of my life. I want to be your servant because you are king over all. Lord, whoever would pray like that today, hear them, let them become your child today. I know that you will because you promised you would. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for this marvelous thing that we celebrate with all of our heart and soul and mind and body, the resurrection of Jesus. And it's in his name that we thank you. Amen. we started our service with Jesus appearing to Mary and let's read about when he appeared to the rest of the disciples on the evening of that first day of the week when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders Jesus came and stood among them and said Shalom peace be with you After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone his sins, they are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. May God bless us as we have shared in his truth and his word and his power today. Amen.